Yeah, please, that's your seat. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining our joint press conference today, um, entitled Human Rights and Democracy in Cambodia Ahead of the Commune and Sangkak Council Elections. Uh, my name is Lee Chong Lun. I am the Program Officer for Campaign and Advocacy from the Asian Network for Free Elections. Today, uh, together with me on the panel, we have uh, first on the left, Phil Robertson, the Deputy Director of the Asia Division of Human Rights Watch. Um, we also have Mr. Kasip Pirom, uh, the ASEAN Parliamentarian for Human Rights board member and also uh, so former so far, so far, so um, foreign minister of Thailand. <laughs> <laughs> the third speaker, to, uh, the fourth speaker today is uh, Miss Sanha Wan Sisot. She is a legal advisor of um, the ICJ's Asia Pacific programs. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. We still have seats in front, so don't be shy. You can move on, uh, move yeah, up a bit. Well. Um, so today, this is a joint press conference of these four organizations, and we will share our findings on the human rights and democracy situation in Cambodia uh, before the election next month. So uh, each speaker will be given 10 minutes to present their findings, and then we will follow by a Q&A session. Well, first of all, I would like to represent um, NFRAL to present our latest pre-election assessment report on the upcoming Komin and Sangkat Council election. So ANFRA has been observing the elections in Cambodia since uh, 1998, and we have been observing different national assembly elections and also the local elections over 24 years. Uh, and this time, ANFRA is not uh, going to officially engage in the, or observe in the Commune and Sangkat Council election next month, but we did this pre-election assessment report uh, we did the assessment on the pre-election conditions and environment in Cambodia by sending uh, our electoral analysts to the ground and interview different stakeholders in the country. So this is our report. Um, you can scan the QR code to get the, the full report on our, on our website. Well, the report um, outline is uh, on the screen. So we have um, assessed assess the elections on different aspects. Uh, from the legal framework, election administration, from political parties, civil society engagement, as well as media freedom, and also voter education, participation of marginalized sectors. And at last, we have listed down a list of recommendations for the Cambodian authorities to improve the election. Well, first of all, it's about the legal framework of the Cambodia election. So no, there's no significant changes uh, that have been made to the election law since 2017. And um, most of the, the assessment that ANFRA did in 2017 and the 2018 elections remain the same. There's no much changes to the election laws. I, I think I would like to highlight a few things here. The first is uh, the local government autonomy, uh, which is the, I mean, the 
Commune and Sangkat Council is not guaranteed um, because the ministry, ministry of Interior of Cambodia, they have the power to announce any resolutions of uh, this Commune and Sangkat Council if they run against um, the spirit of constitution and also the national security. These are very ambiguous ground and um, therefore we conclude that uh, yeah, there is no autonomy in the local government and political parties, they can be dissolved by the court just like what they did to the CNRP in 2017 and also the activities of the political parties that can be suspended by the MOI anytime if the MOI, I mean the Ministry of Interior find that the political parties uh, did some activities that um, do not fulfill the national interest. So this is a very ambiguous ground and um, the dissolution of parties, although it put it under the court, but uh, there should not be any um, power given to the executive, executive power to suspend any political parties uh, activities and also their political rights. Lastly, it's about uh, the latest COVID-19 laws that have been enacted in over the two years and you know it has been there has been a lot of restriction to civil society and political parties to carry out the activities so we expect that the opposition parties they would face many challenges in conducting their election campaigns in, uh, in the lead up to the election. So yeah, they would definitely scale down their activities. Uh, this is based on what we get from the interviews with the opposition parties. As for the election administration, um, the National Election Committee of Cambodia, they are made up of nine members. Uh, according to the laws, four are appointed by the ruling party in the National Assembly. And another four are appointed by uh, the opposition parties that have members in the National Assembly and the remaining one uh, will be appointed based on common consensus of uh, both ruling and opposition parties. But since the re um, dissolution of the CNRP in 2017 and in 2018, the ruling CPP, they won all seats in the National Assembly. Um, and after that, some uh, NEC members appointed by CNRP, they have resigned and new NEC members have been appointed by the CPP. So now, uh, seven out of nine members of the NEC, they are actually appointed by the ruling CPP. And the remaining two, uh, one is from the former CNRP, and another one is uh, representing civil society group. And the NEC is widely perceived as not independent and pro-CCP, although the law requires that uh, the NEC uh, members uh, at the local level, they have to be independent and non-partisan, but uh, based on our interviews with different stakeholders in the country, the opposition parties and the CSO, they all think that the NEC is not going to be independent when they carry out um, the election management and also when they con conduct the election um, in the country. And thirdly, the finance of the NEC um, is not independent, it is in still in dependent on the executive branch so the budget have to be approved um, by the Ministry of, in, uh, the fin ministry of Finance. Uh, this is a common problem in many countries where um, the budget of the election management body are still largely dependent on uh, the executive power. In January this year, the NEC revised the regulation and procedures for the upcoming um, Commune and Council election. I think one of the most notable changes that the NEC will stop providing this form 1102, which is the minute of the ballot counting. Um, so at the end of the election day, after they count the vote, they will write down the uh, vote counting result in this form 1102. In the previous election, uh, the NEC would give out this form 1102 to all party agents present in the, at the polling station. So everyone would get a copy so that they have proof that uh, the result in this polling station is uh, stated on that form but in the upcoming election they are going to stop providing this form but they would display the form at the polling station instead and this phase opposition um, from the, uh, the opposition parties and also election monitoring group they think that they should uh, the NEC should revert back to the original um, regulation where the copies are going to be given out to all 
parties. And the NEC, they say that they are going to Hello? keep this new regulation, cut, cut. but at the end they say they will leave it to the local community to decide whether to give out the copies or not. Uh -huh. And we think that the NEC should give a clear guideline and they should listen to the feedback from opposition parties and also election monitoring group, which is to keep the original um, rules, to give out copies to the, uh, I mean the, to give out copies of this uh, minute of ballot counting to the party agents so that they will have the confidence in the uh, vote counting process and also the result. The next thing is about the civil society engagement in Cambodia in the lead up to the election. Um, I'm sure that the, the other um, panel speakers would talk about a lot of um, human rights violation happening in the country. So right now in Cambodia, the civil society is not just um, in a repressive environment, it's a nearly closed civic space and because of different crackdowns against independent media, opposition parties and also civil society members. And the draconian uh, law on association and also NGO are still in place. And I think w the important thing to note here is, the j is that joint election observation activities uh, in Cambodia, they were warned that uh, this, is this is going to violate the uh, Lango. And our members in, uh, mem NFL's member in Cambodia, they have the feedback that they were not allowed to do election observation together because the Cambodian authorities said that they should register themselves. Although it's an informal collaboration between different election monitoring groups. And the authorities of Cambodia, they repeatedly accuse of election monitoring group in the country that they are pro-opposition and they attempt to launch a color revolution. Um, the local CSOs in the country, um, they have some activities in the lead up to the election. First, they're going to observe the election. And at the same time, they also advocate of this minimum conditions for legitimate commune and Sangkat council elections. So they have this document. Uh, which endorsed by 64 local CSOs, which you can find on um, NFL members' conference website. So it's a list of demands that this CSO demanded that uh, the authorities should have improved the condition in the country before, um, have the, before having this uh, local council elections in June. And I think another thing we would like to highlight is in the lead up to the June election, the NEC, they have already accredited some um, observers, local observers in the, in the country. And we found that over 97% of these local observers, they are actually um, from the pro-CCP organization. They are not independent monitoring group. Um, they are mainly from two organizations led by the son of uh, Prime Minister Hun Sen and also another one led by the Deputy uh, Prime Minister. So we can find more details and the breakdown of this list of uh, candidates on our, on our report and also in NEC's website. Um, in any democracy country, the uh, credible election observer, they should be non-partisan and independent and the NEC shouldn't appoint any partisan or dubious uh, election observers at all. The next sub chapter is about uh, political parties, candidate registration, and also election campaign. Um, so far, the NEC has disqualified at least 183 candidates based on the ground that they are illiterate. So according to Cambodia's election law, the candidate have to be able to write and read Khmer language. And the NEC, they disqualify these candidates mostly from the candidate party. Uh, they say that they are not able to read or write Khmer language. And, but according to our interviews with the opposition parties, they say that yes, there are some members, they are actually, I mean, some candidates, they are actually illiterate, but the NEC disqualified the whole list of candidates when they find out um, there are some candidates who are being illiterate. So this is actually not right at all. It's a collective punishment to, to all the candidates uh, on the list. And uh, opposition candidates and members and also party agents, especially from the candidate party, they also have the feedback that they face persecution and intimidation by the lo local authorities in a different way. Um, for example, there are threats from local police and also from the local authorities. And they also being uh, threatened to, um, to withdraw their candidacies or withdraw from being a party agent 
uh, of opposition parties. And uh, as a result, many candidates and party agents, they actually chose to withdraw their participation after suffering from this intimidation and pressure on the ground. I think in, uh, another interesting finding is that the Prime Minister Hun Sen, they actually uh, repeatedly they demand um, call for the local part, local authorities to open the space for free and fair election, open the space for participation of opposition parties and ruling parties on the ground. But it's another story on the ground where the local authorities they still intimidate um, opposition candidates. And there were also concerns raised by uh, different stakeholders that the candidate party would be dissolved uh, when we see that the candidate party, they are now the second largest party in the country and they also receive quite a lot of support. So there were concerns that they would be being dissolved if either before or after the election, just like the CNRP in 2017. And at the same time, the CPP officials, they were also being reported that uh, they have warned, of, um, warned that their this violation of this uh, law on political parties um, as the candidate parties is uh, supported by Sam Renzi. Um, and Frau thinks that Cambodia authorities, they must respect the spirit of multi-party democracy in the country. Um, first of all, they should enable um, the participation of different political parties, including the opposition ones, to participate freely in the, political in, the polit in the political process in the country in the lead up to the election. Even after the election, the authorities should also respect the political rights of opposition parties um, in the lead up to the next National Assembly election. Uh, next, we will also have some assessment on the current media freedom and access to information in the country. Uh, first of all, of course, it's very clear that the Cambodia um, press freedom and press freedom index has declined over the years, and uh, the Cambodian authorities they have imposed different measures that led to different censorship, shutdown of new website, and also the arrest of journalists in the past few years. So um, the independent media in the country are very little nowadays, and media often choose to self censor themselves when they cover uh, sensitive sensitive issues. And when they cover the election issues, they usually choose to self-censor themselves due to the fear about retaliation from the authorities. So in the lead up to the election, we expect very little fair election reporting in the country. And uh, voters interviewed by Enfrel, they actually expressed that they are interested in going out to vote in the election. And we see that the uh, voter turnout in the past election are actually quite high in the country. Um, I think this is also thanks to uh, the growing social media use in the country as it become the dominant source of information among uh, Cambodians. But at the same time, uh, the traditional media is still uh, the most accessible one, especially for the rural communities. And uh, here we would like to uh, give credit to the NEC as they actually have active presence on social media and also they also actively share the information on their website, they update it very regularly, so we give the credit when it's due. Um, and at the same time, the local CSO, they give the feedback that they actually face uh, very limited, um, they have very limited access to resources, either financial and also manpower to conduct any voter education activities on the ground. As for the participation of marginalized sector uh, in the report, we actually outline the participation of women, uh, persons with disabilities, LGBT, and also youth. But I would like to highlight here uh, the women. Uh, there are more women candidates in the 2022 election uh, compared to 2017. We, had, we, had, we are going to have 32% of women um, among the candidates compared to 27% in 2017, which is a good sign. There's an um, improvement there. And we see that uh, some political parties, they have a good uh, number of women candidates. Um, for example, like Cambodians National Party and Khmer Unity Party, they have more than 50% of women candidates. But unfortunately, the major party, which are the uh, CPP and also the Candlelight Party, they're actually having the lowest women candidate among the 17 parties that are going to contest in the election. 
and uh, for example, like the Connellac party, they only have 23%. When we ask them why um, they have such a low women participation, they, actually, they say that they are relatively new. Um, I mean, they're just being reactivated recently and they do not have any policy about getting more women uh, participation yet. And at the same time, person with disability voters, they continue to face different challenges. And many of them, they actually still have not register as a voter because they don't even have an ID card to register as a voter because of accessibility issues. And many political parties, they actually do not have any uh, disability rights in their policy, I mean, related to disability rights in their policies at all. Um, so this is uh, the, the area that uh, political parties and also um, the authority for the Cambodian authorities to improve. So overall, Cambodia is still four shots of the standard of democratic elections. Uh, so this is the uh, conclusion of our finding. Uh, we do not expect to see any free and fair election in the upcoming um, June election, simply because um, based on the di different indi indicator, like from the election management to the treatment for political parties, the space for CSO and for the media, uh, of course, we do not, we are not going to expect to see any um, space for free and fair election and there will be no genuine legitimate election outcome as long as there are many threats against the opposition parties and also the civil society groups. Uh, NFRAL urged the Cambodian authorities to take uh, meaningful steps, genuine efforts to democratization and political reforms first they have to start by allowing opposition parties and civil society to run freely uh, to operate freely not just before the election and also after the election and in the lead up to the next National Assembly election. So there will be no free and fair election as long as there are threats, intimidation against opposition parties on the ground. So that's our finding. Um, feel free to download our report to, to, to read the full report here. Uh, it's on our, on our website. And we welcome feedback um, on this report. And NFRAL uh, we'll, go we'll be going to consistently and continuously monitor uh, the election um, from inside and outside the country and we will also share our findings um, after the June elections. Well, uh, up next I would like to invite uh, Phil Robertson from Human Rights Watch to share his findings on the upcoming elections. Uh, thank you very much. <coughs> Uh, my name is Phil Roberts, and I'm the Deputy Asia Director for Human Rights Watch. It's a pleasure to be here. I, I want to thank Enfrel for organizing this uh, uh, press conference, and I also want to thank them for that excellent report uh, that really is very comprehensive about the pre-election situation in Cambodia. Um, and uh, I think that's going to be a very useful tool as people try to assess what the situation is there and, and whether it's going to be a free and fair election. At the outset, I want to say I think it's worth doing a bit of a comparison exercise to put the situation in Cambodia in context. Actually, comparing the previous national commune elections five years ago in 2017 uh, to today. Uh, those uh, 2017 commune elections were arguably one of the high points of Cambodia democracy uh, in the past 20 years. It was uh, an election. Uh, which many people point to as showing what is possible if actually Cambodia wanted to have uh, a free and fair election and wanted to have democracy. Uh, to review, um, in 2017, pre-election violence against candidates and their supporters was at an all-time low. Uh, and this is in a country where harassment, intimidation, and violence in the run-up uh, to elections, and certainly during the campaign period, is usually quite high. Uh, unfortunately, in 2022, that's not the case. We're already seeing an uptick in uh, incidents of violence. And the actual National Election Commission has issued guidance calling all sides to refrain from violence uh, in the lead up to the election. But it's worth considering that only the ruling party, the Cambodian People's Party, uh, and the government have actually police and military at their beck and call ready to do their bidding. Um, since historically the ruling Cambodian People's Party with its absolute control of the police and military is a source of this violence, what we've seen in the past, what happened in 2017, if we look back, 
reflected an apparent confidence at that time in the CPP that they could actually run a Democrat, as a Democratic Party based on a record of economic development rather than resorting to intimidation uh, of opposition parties and their supporters. This time around, uh, they're not experimenting. They are resorting to more, their more traditional approaches. Uh, there's a lot of handouts. There's a lot of economic corruption. But it's also combined with claims now to have saved the country from COVID and, of course, the intimidation factor. Importantly, if we look at back at 2017, according to election monitoring NGOs, uh, that hands-off policy also, uh, also continued through the conduct of the election and resort resulted in a remarkably clean exercise with re relatively little political interference from the NEC, <laughs> relatively transparent um, conduct of the elections, and over 90% of eligible voters voting in those 2017 commune elections. That was the highest uh, uh, turnout uh, to date. Uh, there were also international uh, and national election monitors who were very active in 2017, which is quite different from today, uh, as you heard, where local monitors are primarily coming from one side, from the government. Now, it's obviously unclear how many voters will turn out in 2022, and it's, it's good to hear that people still want to vote, that they still have confidence in democracy. They want to try to have their voices heard. But as you've heard also, the NEC has now been packed with CPP loyalists. And there have already been controversial, non-transparent uh, decisions by the NEC to cut opposition candidate -like party candidates from the contesting election. Uh, uh, the National Election Commission has removed a total of 150 commune council candidates from the candidate party ahead of the June election. And that's prompted an outcry from party officials, quite understandably. Um, uh, we've got 11 communes that have been struck from the contest, including eight in Phnom Penh. Uh, that composed, uh, composed 116 candidates, two in Kampong Cham, 24 candidates, and one in Persad. And these are all candlelight party slates. Uh, similarly, as you've heard, the opposition parties are claiming that their proposed election observers for the day of the election have faced threats. Uh, yet the NEC has really failed to act on those complaints. Uh, candidates have also been harassed by authorities who demanded that they resign as candlelight party candidates. We've got police who have forced uh, them to appear with arbitrary summons uh, on, on various different uh, bogus charges, such as claims of document forgery. Uh, and candlelight party candidates and supporters have faced discriminatory actions by local officials, including threats to withhold public services and removal of their ID poor cards. Um, if we look back at 2017, the CPP actually won the election with just over 50% of the uh, overall vote. But the opposition party at the time, the Cambodian National Rescue Party, won 43.8% of the overall vote. And in terms of election chiefs at that time in 2017, the CPP won uh, 1,156 compared to 489 to the CNRP. Councillor seats were 6,503 for the CPP versus 5,007 to the CNRP. So there was a, an actual election that res had, had results, that there was a significant in increase in support of the opposition, and that was actually uh, translated through into the results. But quite clearly, the idea of real democratic competition and even the remote possibility that the Cambodian People's Party might be voted out of power was too much for Hun Sen. And so in 2018, uh, in a bogus politically motivated ruling, the Supreme Court which is headed actually by a judge who sits in the top council of the Cambodian People's Party, dissolved the CNRP claiming that, that it was behind a color revolution to overthrow the government, again with no evidence, forced the resignation of the CNRP council chiefs and councillors and barred top CNRP officials, including all the national members of parliament who were from the CNRP from politics for five years. And now many of those officials have fled overseas into exile, escaping arrest, uh, the Cambodian government is currently engaged in mass trials against dozens of other political opposition activists on ridiculous charges like, quote, conspiracy to commit a felony, unquote, whatever that means. And the result is that today's commune uh, councils, with the exception of one, and all the entire uh, national parliament, all uh, 125 uh, members of parliament, are all from the CPP. So it really is a single party state at this time. And it's changed from uh, what looked like was moving towards a multi-party democracy with real meaning in 2017 to this. Um, 
It's an also important to recognize that back in 2017, there was significant independence of the media, with the Cambodian Daily and Phnom Penh Post both publishing English and Khmer papers. Beehive Radio was active. There were many FM radio stations that were broadcasting foreign radio reports in Khmer, including those from Radio Free Asia and Voice of America. So if you wanted to get alternative sources of news that were not controlled by the government, you were able to do so. Today in 2022, the Cambodia Daily is no more. All TV and radio is controlled by the government. Uh, RFA has been kicked out of the country. The Phnom Penh Post is owned by Hun Sen Crony, and it goes on and on and on. There is a smattering of small English language websites that are producing some uh, original content in English, some in independent content. Uh, but again, it's, it's, it's uh, uh, just a, a, a ghost of what used to exist there. And back in 2017, civil society was also very active uh, with the Situation Room operating, uh, a group of NGOs that were meeting regularly, sharing information, consulting about what was happening, not only on election monitoring, but also human rights situations and others. Um, they were sharing these information with various uh, UN agency personnel, with uh, p diplomats from various embassies, to urge that they intervene with the government. This is democratic advocacy. There was actual things taking place. Today, as you've heard uh, from the ANFO report, NGOs are facing harassment, abuse, and intimidation, uh, with the law and NGOs being used to arbitrarily target NGO critics. So there's really a, a, a massive uh, change in the weather in Cambodia that took place between 2017 and now. And it's astonishing uh, and, and, and somewhat exciting that you actually have uh, a party like the Candlelight Party that has stepped up and decided to contest these elections despite all the undemocratic actions and rights abusing uh, uh, actions that have been taken uh, to try to constrict the democratic space. Uh, we don't know how the actual election will be conducted, but it's quite concerning that uh, intimidation against election observers seems to be sort of a, a top issue uh, that we're hearing about. Because what certainly happened in the 2018 elections, and I was over in Phnom Penh for them, was that there was clear cheating that took place. Um, and it was cheating despite the fact that the CNRP no longer existed. The whole issue was trying to defeat a CNRP called boycott of the election and trying to make sure that the numbers were, were pumped up. Uh, and there were a number of cases where uh, the number of votes in, in various different polling places were more than the registered voters. And they had you know, these kind of things going on. Um, you know, so 2018, really, if we say it was the sort of depths of this, we don't know where the 2022 election is going to come out compared to 2017 and 2018. Uh, it's likely that it will not be free and fair. Uh, it's likely that we will see more violence uh, leading up to the election. Uh, I expect to see more intimidation, particularly against candlelight party candidates, because that is the one party that actually has registered enough candidates to really challenge for power. And if I think the, the ruling party feels that it needs to cheat, unfortunately it will be able to do so because we will not have election monitors and others on the ground who are going to be able to ascertain that and point it out. So it, it is a very grim situation. Uh, I'm happy to talk further about the, the wider human rights situation in Cambodia in the question and answer session, but I wanted to let the other panelists uh, have their say. So thank you very much. Thanks, Phil. Uh, I would like to invite Mr. Kassit to uh, share his views. Thank you, and, and thank you for the invitation. I, I have not much to add to what Chong and Phil uh, have been uh, saying. I do agree with all their findings and their view and so on. I think the concluding word is that there will not be any free and fair elections in Cambodia in a few days' time or next year for the national elections and so on, because the road to the elections has already been paved with harassment, intimidation, unfair practices by the authorities in being. So if the, I think the preparatory uh, days to the actual election is not conducive to any semblance of democracy and protection of human rights, then the actual election on the election day cannot be free and fair. And in this context, then uh, we should be able to welcome 
the statement of the European Parliament, which was issued yesterday, already reprimanding the uh, Hun Sen government and calling upon the, I think, the European Union authorities to impose further sanctions on the Hun Sen government for misbehavior and for suppression and uh, denial of uh, democracy and the human rights in Cambodia. That is one point. The second point is that I just would like to uh, recall a bit to the, I think, the peace agreement in, in Cambodia, I think, and the first election after the civil war in Cambodia and so on in 1993. First is that the peace agreement did mention very clearly about the holding of the free and fair election. And I think uh, in that sense, it is still the duty of the United Nations on behalf of the international community to keep on monitoring what is going on in terms of the democratization process in Cambodia. And now, with the two reports for coming from my two colleagues, then it is incumbent upon the United Nations to really pay more attention to the upcoming elections and so on. And the United Nations as a whole must do something I think through the I think intervention and initiative of the UN Secretary General, it is his duty to report to the I think UN Security Council or to the UN General Assembly as a whole and for the international community to do something about the plight of democracy and the need of freedom and human rights in Cambodia. That's the first point. The second point is that after the first national elections in 1993, the Somdet Hun Sen was defeated. The, the, the election was being won by the Fun, Fun, Sep, Fun Sep Party. But uh, at that time, Hun Sen controlled the, the armored forces. So he was able, in spite of the defeat, to force himself to become the co-prime minister of Cambodia. And since 1993, he has been able to keep on getting rid of any opposition forces and so on. So the upcoming communal election is, I think, somewhat of a farce, a play, just to buy some sort of legitimacy to some that Hun Sen for this upcoming election and for the next election, because there is no real opposition. Or if there were to be any opposition in the name of the Candlelight Party, they have been very much constrained by all type of state powers and the weaponization of the laws and so on to belittle and to deny them activity as much as possible. So it's more or less a one-sided election, which we cannot say that it is a democratic one. And in that sense, I think the international community could not, uh, cannot stay aside and remain silent. It must do something to ensure that the Cambodian people do enjoy the freedom. I think throughout their history in the modern period, they have suffered so much, you know, by the abusive authorities, by the civil war, by the Khmer Rouge and all of that. And I think they have been living in fear, under intimidation and repression, suppression by the current uh, government of Cambodia for too long now. And I think it's about time that I think the international community uh, do wake up and I think make a move in order to ensure that the life and the future of the Cambodian uh, should be like anyone else that would love to be living in freedom and in a democratic uh, setting. On, be on, on behalf of APHR, which I represent, we will continue to do as much as we can to alert the international community to try to link up to the CSO inside Cambodia and so on, and also to keep on pushing the ASEAN Human Rights Commission for them to act accordingly, and also to the ASEAN leadership that they cannot ignore the plight of the Cambodian people. They should not only, I think, entertain the relationship with the uh, governmental side or the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Cambodian authorities. They have to think of the people. And because of the fact that the ASEAN leaders have been saying that ASEAN is a people-centered organization. And uh, for them to show that mantle and their belief in what they say, 
they have to reach out to the Cambodian people and they have to face up to the, I think, abuse, abusive authoritarian uh, practices of Somdet Hun Sen himself and his government in particular. So I, this is what I have to add to my two colleagues. And thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks, Mr. Kassit. Ms. Thanks, Mr. Kassit. Next, I would like to pass the mic to Ms. Sanhawan from the ICJ, uh, which I believe she will cover uh, the freedom of expression and information issues in Cambodia. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you so much and for, for inviting me to uh, speak today. And on behalf of the ICJ, we are delighted to be giving this opportunity to speak with you today. Um, I agree with all the observations made by uh, other speakers, but would like to use this opportunity to highlight on certain human rights and law, law of law issues and situations uh, within the country. As the country get ready for the elections in June this year, we are still deeply concerned about uh, the continuous violation of human rights and law of law principles in Cambodia, um, I would like to use this opportunity to highlight three particular issues of concern of the ICJ to you. The first one is about the shrinking civic and democratic space within the country, including in the digital sphere. The second one is the lack of independence and accountability for just state actors. And the third one is about the impunity enjoyed by perpetrators of gross human rights violations in the country. On the uh, first issue, the shrinking of civic and the democratic space in the country. I mean, sadly, as mentioned by other speakers, it's very common in Cambodia for uh, political opponents, human rights defenders, uh, journalists, social media users to be arrested, prosecuted, detained, and convicted for merely exercising their uh, freedom of expression. The crackdown was done through several laws which are not compliant with uh, Cambodian international human rights obligations, especially the right to, uh, uh, those related to the right to free expression. In December last year, the ICJ released a report uh, entitled The Curtailing of uh, Free Expression and Information Online in Cambodia. And we look into several laws in the countries that have been used to uh, criminalize, to attack the government critics those include the, <coughs> sorry, the interministerial podcast on, <coughs> sorry, I'm bad with air conditioners. <laughs> the interministerial podcast on website and social media control that was used to monitor block uh, the content on website and social media, and also several provisions of the criminal court, including. Uh, Article 425, which criminalized the communication and disclosure of false information. Article 437, which that, uh, is a less majestic provision in Cambodian law. Article 453, which criminalized the act of prodding. Article 494 and 495, which uh, criminalized the act of incitement to commit felony or disturb social security. We found that these provisions and others' provisions are compatib in, uh, incompatible with Cambodian international human rights obligations. They are very vague and overboard, which left them open for abusive and arbitrary applications by the authorities. They also impose criminal punishment on the violator, which is inconsistent with the principle of necessity and proportionality under international human rights law, which uh, require that criminal laws can be used to restrict uh, expression only in the more serious and exceptional cases. In addition, apart from this exceeding law, in the past few years, Cambodian government continued to draft and pass several laws that are equally incom incompatible with international human rights obligations. For example, the National uh, Internet Gateway subdegree, which require all the internet traffic to be ruled through a regulatory body before it leaves users. It also empowers the operator to block the contents of the internet network, which deem to be affect safety, national revenue, social order, dignity, culture, tradition, custom. But that's meant everything you know, that is not in favor of the government. And of course, these provisions raise serious concern that they will be used to interfere with the rights to free expression, information, the right to privacy, uh, including in the lead up of the elections. 
Uh, by the way, in, uh, the internet, the national internet gateway subdegree, is supposed to be entered into force early this year. However, it was postponed, and according to the government, it was due to the disruption caused by the spreading of the COVID-19. In addition, we also observed that the shrinking of civic space were intensified during the COVID-19 pandemic. The state uh, attempt to suppress criticisms and dissent towards a mismanagement response on the pandemic by arresting, uh, charging, detaining those uh, who post their, who express their opinion online, including political opponents. For example, Sam Rangzi, the former leader of the CNRP, he was charged in December 2020 for commenting on the government vaccine plan and to, uh, for expressing his opinion about the king. On the second issues on the lack of independence and accountability of justice actor, in 2017, the ICJ launched a report, and one of the key findings of that report was that uh, the latest problem led, uh, facing Cambodia Justice Act is the lack of independence and impartial judges and prosecutors. And unfortunately, five years later, these observations are still true. Recently, in March this year, the UN Human Rights Committee just issued a concluding observation on the situation of Cambodia, and they found the same conclusions, and they made the same co uh, recommendation like we did five years ago. They found that there's still a lot of a high number of allegations of corruption within the judiciary in Cambodia. They also found that some judges are openly members of the ruling party, which really uh, seriously undermine their independence. It is very concerning because uh, having a judge being a member of the ruling party means they could be used as a tool, and indeed, reportedly, they were used as a tool to uh, attack the political opponents. Uh, as Phil already mentioned, for example, the president of the Supreme Court who presides over the case of the dissolution of the CNRP in 2017. He's a key member of the CPP. Uh, in addition to these all of the problems, we also got reports about uh, the lack of adherence to the basic fair trial rights, including the high reliance on confessions in Cambodian court. And um, it is reportedly common practice uh, amongst police there to use any means through uh, psychological and physical pressures to extract confessions and statements. In case involving political opinions and human rights defenders, there is also reportedly always a presumption of guilt. Lastly, on the issue of the lack of accountability for perpetrators of gross human rights violations, based on our observation, there very exists a culture of impunity in relations to gross human rights violation perpetrated in the countries. Human Rights Watch has estimated that over 300 people have been killed in politically motivated attack since the 1991 Paris Peace Agreement. And however, there's a lack of uh, progress when it comes to investigation and prose uh, prosecution to, for those responsible for these uh, human rights violations. An example is an assassination of the, political, uh, of the prominent political commentator, Kim Lee. He was shot in 2016 against the backdrop of escalating attack on civil society and political positions. The police quickly arrest a suspect. And according to police, the suspect uh, confessed to the crime. In March uh, 2017, after only a half day trial, the court found that the suspect guilty for the murder and sentenced him to life imprisonment. How, however, the trial left unanswered uh, many questions about the investigation, which appear to be very seriously deficient. This raised concern that the prosecutor only prioritized uh, to secure a quick conviction rather than very effectively investigate into the cases. And despite repeated call from civil society actors, the Cambodian authority haven't yet set up any independent commissions of inquiry to really conduct an impartial, independent, independent and effective investigations into his death. This issue, the shrinking civic and democratic space in the countries, the lack of independent and accountability of justice actor, and the lack of accountability for perpetrator of human rights abuse and violations, 
very demonstrate the uh, government's intolerance toward dissents and oppositions. And indeed, this raises serious concern that the authority will do more of the same or even worse in the lead up of these elections. Of course, uh, on behalf of the ICJ, we repeatedly call and we keep calling for Cambodia to repeal or substantially amend the law that are not him still not compliance with it, international human rights standard, to ensure that just the actor will be independent and impartial, to ensure that all uh, the investigation will be carried out in an effectively impartial, independent manner into all allegations of human rights violation. Otherwise, uh, we think that it would be difficult for this election to be free, fair, and democratic. That's all from us, and thank you so much. Well, thank you, Phil. Kasit and Sanha Wan for um, presenting their findings. Um, next, I would like to open up, uh, I would like to invite um, media and NGO colleagues to ask questions. If you have any questions or if you have any comments, feel free to share as well. Yeah, there's a <coughs> just a mo note, there's a microphone at the back so people can uh, use that. And also, if um, I think there's some 40 people who are watching online, so obviously if they have questions uh, online and they want to type that in the comment section of the Facebook Live program that uh, uh, the FCCT is, is broadcasting, I will read those out. Uh, anyone? Well, there is a feedback to us that um, why we talk about the human rights and democracy in Cambodia, on Cambodia, but there is no one single Cambodian on a panel. Um, well, um, it's actually not easy to get a Cambodian in the country to talk about human rights and democracy, um, especially in the such a repressive environment in the country. So I think, um, so us, uh, international NGO working from outside Cambodia, uh, we are also we are trying our best to um, use our liberty, although it's limit limited, outside the country to help promote um, the human rights uh, situation in the country. So um, yeah, maybe next time we try to get one, but unfortunately we don't have any Cambodian on the panel this time. Apologies for that. Uh, yes. uh, just to help explain, many of prominent Cambodian colleagues of mine who are also of them are member of APHR. They are persona non grata in Thailand. They could not come into Thailand because of the government of General Prayut. So I think it's incumbent upon all of us, we Thai, to pressure the government to open up for good Cambodians to visit Thailand and to be less, f the, for the Thai government to be less accommodative with some that Hun Sen for other political reasons and so on. That's the first point. Second, when I mentioned about the UN uh, administration and going back to, I think, the 1993 elections and to the free and fair, I was speaking on behalf of my very close colleague, uh, Mu Sokyo, I think the, one of the leaders of the, I think, the refound, rescued National Party of Cambodia under Som Rangsi, and also uh, that she's in exile at the moment because she could not get into Cambodia or to come to Thailand and so on, but we have been on correspondence. So the word free and fair election was very much uh, reflected on what she has been keep on pressing me to mention this to the meeting this morning. But uh, so we try to, or I try to represent the voices, the good voices of the Cambodian side as much as possible. Thank you. Can I, uh, let me also add something. Um, <coughs> You know, one of the reasons we also don't have Cambodian voices here uh, is that we have seen a campaign of systematic uh, repression against uh, political exiles in Thailand uh, from Cambodia. Uh, people should not forget that last November and December, uh, the Thai government arrested and forcibly returned UNHCR recognized refugees, uh, at least four people that we know of. Um, and you know this was done over the objections of the UNHCR. It was done over the objections of diplomats from a number of different embassies. 
uh, who had raised concerns about Thailand's obligation to protect refugees and not send them back into harm's way. Those people who were sent back have since been uh, tried, and a number of them have been convicted and basically sentenced to long prison terms, uh, proving that, in fact, they did fear persecution for their political uh, actions and political activities. Um, it's also important to recognize that uh, because of that, uh, what was a, essentially a fairly vibrant group of Cambodian National Rescue Party supporters here who were involved in uh, you know, broadcasting news by Facebook Live back into Cambodia have all now scattered. Uh, and in fact, um, they would be very concerned to actually come here mm -hmm. because they feel that that would then put them in the crosshairs of the Thai government to be arrested. What is also quite clear is that there is communication between Phnom Penh and Bangkok, uh, between the police departments of those two, where if Cambodia wants someone in Thailand, they are relaying that to the Thai police, and the Thai police are going out and finding those people. So there is what I call a, essentially a swap mark, where uh, the governments of Cambodia and Thailand are working with each other to try to persecute uh, the people who have fled uh, either from Thailand to Cambodia or from Cambodia to Thailand, the political refugees. Uh, and, you know, it's not safe for those people anymore. So for some Cambodian uh, representative to come to this panel would be an incredible act of bravery and would cause probably significant problems for them with the Thai authorities, which is why you don't see one here. I, I do support Phil because uh, I used to be able to meet many of the Cambodian political exiles and so on and to try to speak to some of the Thai authorities, especially the police and the immigration, not to harass them, you know, and not to arrest them because they come as a political excite. They run away from suppression at home. So we should have the generosity of the heart to look after them. APHR also did mention occasionally to the Thai government at various occasions and so on, but we have not been able to get any response or cooperative effort from the Thai government. And I think this is an ugly episode of the behavior of the Thai government and the various security forces and so on. They are fellow human beings, and we profess to be a democratic country, and yet we have not been able to protect our fellow Democrats coming from Cambodia or even from Myanmar before that and so on. So this is something that we all have to work and tell our political parties, parliament, politicians, and the government in particular for them to behave accordingly. Democracy is the name of the game. Human rights is a human responsibility. And we cannot uh, go on, I think, catering to the wishes of authoritarian regimes around Thailand. Thank you. Yes, yeah. hello, is this on? My name's Sam Wright, I'm a club member. Uh, I'm wondering what your response would be to the cynical people who uh, suggest that a, a turn to the UN for a solution is uh, a misplaced uh, trust, given that, the, as Wikipedia says here, the United Nations authority in Cambodia held the 1993 election and had peacekeeping troops there to make sure it was a fair, fairly held. Uh, and then the outcome was that the winner uh, did not win. Uh, and the UN says, okay, thank you, that's a good election, and walked away. Does anyone want to take, want to take the question? I think we have to keep on trying in spite of the, I think, shortcomings of the United Nations. Uh, so we have to press. I think the surprising thing is that a few days ago in Kiev, the UN Secretary General did take the initiative to set up the humanitarian corridor in Ukraine. But the coup d'etat in Myanmar is already a year old. We haven't heard even one word from him about humanitarian assistance to be coordinated by the UN Secretary General. But we are all members of the UN, and I think we have to keep on pressing. And it's the only viable 
entity in the world today that has the experiences in the humanitarian work in a conflict situation. I think we cannot give up the hope and the fact that we pay the UN Secretary General to do his work and then that's what we have to keep on pressing him to do. And it's not only the UN Secretary General, I think the permanent members of the UN uh, Security Council and I think the non-permanent also at the moment is, I think it's Vietnam from, from the ASEAN countries. I think we have to keep on reminding the UN and so on. And uh, for each of the member states to keep on pushing for the organization to do the right thing on behalf of the ordinary uh, uh, people. Uh -huh. I think one cannot give up, but when we have to keep on pushing. That's what it is. And here, I think we have to push first the Thai government to behave accordingly. So far, they have not been. I think we have to render more voices. And second, I threw all the ASEAN countries and so on to, for them to play a more active role at the United Nations uh, in, in New York. Thank you. Uh, I would add a few things. Um, I mean, as you know, there is a, an Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights in Cambodia. Uh, and so uh, they are continuing to uh, carry out their mission to do monitoring um, of human rights and uh, reporting about the human rights violations and in some cases advocacy with the government. And I think that's very important. But unfortunately, what we see is the UN country team and the UN resident coordinator tend to duck behind that Office of High Commissioner of Human Rights and sort of say, okay, they're dealing with the human rights issues. We don't have to talk about them. And that's the wrong approach. There should be uh, concern for human rights. There should be concern for democracy across all the UN agencies, um, not just the ones that have a particular mandate connected to human rights. Um, so, you know, I mean, I would expect that the UN resident coordinator, the UNDP, UNICEF, UN Women, others, would be willing to raise human rights issues, raise concerns uh, about what is happening in Cambodia, and certainly reflect the fact that the constituencies or the groups of people that their uh, mandates represent are also going to be shortchanged by an unfair election that takes place there. So, I mean, it's important to recognize that, uh, you know, that there needs to be a greater concern to put, uh, as they said, put human rights up front uh, for the UN. Uh, this was initiative uh, by the previous Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, mm -hmm. who said, you know, human rights up front. But what we've seen in places like Cambodia and Myanmar and other places that the UN usually puts human rights down back or forgets about it altogether. And that's unacceptable. Uh, I, I do agree with Phil. And, and not, not to, I think, press myself, but uh, as a... Uh, I was a director general of the International Organization Department at the Foreign Office decades ago. And one of my frequent visitors to my office was a representative of UNHCR all the time. And when I became foreign minister also, the diplomatic corps, UN agency and so on, uh, did come and visit very frequently. Uh, the surprising things today is that there is no communication between the diplomatic corps, the UN agency, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and vice versa. I think we all are failing our duties to humanity and to the ordinary people in Myanmar, in Thailand, and particularly in Cambodia. It used to be a very cordial, of course controversial. I was very much pressured and so on, on the question of the Hmong, the Cambodian refugees, the Ulgu, and all of this, and so on, or even the Rohingya. But I did welcome that, because that was part of my work and my responsibility. And it is not an annoyance to be pressured by some of the ambassadors or by some of the UN agency. So let's uh, rekindle that spirit of cooperation, and I think we, together, collectively, can pressure both the Foreign Office, the Thai government, and the UN agencies, and their diplomatic corps you know, for them to come out and to work together, I think, for the common good as much as possible. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Does anyone else have any more questions for? We have, um, we have four questions online. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so let me, let, me, let me read them out in the order that they've arrived uh, so that, that then we can determine who's going to answer them. 
Um, the first question is from uh, Chandra Sampan. Uh, he says, I want to ask you all one thing. Why the Cambodian government approves the candlelight party in this situation, and what the game theory or strategy that the government uses to play now? I, I think, I think uh, Hun Sen wants to have a semblance of democracy. So to have the candlelight party, it provides a bit of a legitimacy to him and to the elections. You know, but one cannot consider the existence of the candlelight party in isolation with the, all the intimidation, judicial harassment, and all of this, and even the court, or even the national election is all under Hun Sen control. It is an authoritarian government wanting to legitimize itself with a sort of a semblance of a democratic elections. It's a farce, it's nothing that I think we have to be realistic. And we have to force Hun Sen to behave accordingly. And that, and I think f that force must come from the UN bodies and the key members of the UN, uh, even the collective ASEAN leadership of the other nine member states. We cannot plead Hun Sen to change his mind, no. He has not been the play the game of the politics of compromise. I was with him one month in Paris at the first Paris negotiation on the peace for Cambodia. We sat on the opposite side, arguing for one month in the third committee when he was foreign minister. He never played the game of cooperation, collaboration. He only knows some, one thing, winner take all, no opposition. That is the character of the man. And you cannot speak to him in a nice diplomatic language. He has to be forced. And where that force should be forthcoming, it must come from the United Nations and also to the ASEAN body as a whole. Thank you. Um, I agree with Kun because there is more on uh, legitimacy. Um, you know, I'm, I, I think I didn't worry about having the CP uh, because the fact that uh, it is a single party parliament, the fact that they have all the controls over the justice sector actors, and the law is in the hand of the government anyway, and they can abusively apply it whatever way they want. I mean, uh, they, they, they don't have to be worried about, you know, uh, having uh, one more party, because if they start to be a big threat, then, you know, their fate would be like the CNRP, that probably something in his head. Yeah, well, I agree with um, two of my colleagues on the panel. Um, the Scandalite Party is a rightfully registered party in the country. There's no legitimate reason for the authorities to disallow them to register any candidates. And surprisingly, they managed to fill a lot of candidates uh, in this election. And um, I th yeah, they managed to fill in almost all Komin and Sankat Council, and they become like the second largest uh, party in the country, although they have just been reactivated recently. Um, well, of course, uh, as uh, my colleague said, Cambodia is a one-party state now, and Cambodia try to, the authorities try to show that they are open for multi-party democracy. But of course, when the Canadian Party, they gain more support, we also see that there are lots of repression against them on the ground. Uh, as I presented just now, many candidates of the CP, they have been harassed and also disqualified uh, due to certain grounds. Um, but I think this is a, a trend that we still need to closely monitor up in the lead up to the election and even after the election, because, um, well, there are many concerns that um, there is possibility that the Canadian Party may be dissolved if um, they pose a greater threat for the ruling CPP. Just one uh, information. If, when you, if you go to China, they said that uh, it's not only the Communist Party, the only party in China, they will say that uh, there are about seven, eight other smaller parties. So that's another you know, reality, but I think more sounds like a joke. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, what they've, I would say, I, I would agree with my colleagues, and I would say that <coughs> It's very interesting that the, many of these small parties in Cambodia are referred commonly as firefly parties because they sort of uh, flicker on and off uh, for a brief period of time during the summer, during the right before the election, and then they're not seen again for quite some time. So, uh, you know, uh, 
you know, there, it is very interesting that the Candlelight Party has stepped up in such a way and registered so many candidates. I think that really surprised a lot of people. Uh, you know, it was, a, it was a welcome surprise. But many of these other, the, the argument from the Cambodian People's Party has been like, well, we have all these other political parties. We have all these, you know, in this case, 17 parties who are registered. Of course it's democratic, even though they don't recognize that the existence of another party doesn't mean that there's any sort of level playing field uh, on the election side. So um, let me uh, read out one more, uh, let me read another question online and then I think, you know, you're, okay. Um, uh, this is from uh, Matt Sarusko, uh, uh, who's a freelance journalist in Phnom Penh. Uh, he said, there are estimated to be over one million Cambodian migrant workers living in Thailand. Are there any estimates about how many Cambodian migrants are likely to return to Cambodia prior to the June election to vote? Will they be able to cross the border? Do Cambodian migrants have the desire to vote? Uh, I think now the Thai government has opened the border. Yeah. So the coming and the going should not be any more yeah. uh, of a difficulty and so on. But as to how much of the people wanting, I think that question must be posted back to the Cambodian embassy in, in Bangkok. Okay, thank you. Well, I do not have any assessment um, that uh, how many Cambodian migrant workers in Thailand actually have uh, the interest to, to go back to vote. Uh, but the one thing for sure is they are going to spend more money uh, on transportation to, to go back to vote. And we also would like to highlight that uh, in Cambodia right now, there is no mechanism for overseas voters to register as a voter and also to vote overseas. They cannot vote at the embassy. They cannot vote through postal voting. They have to go back to the country to vote in person. So this has, uh, has been a very big barrier um, for those who are living overseas, especially in Thailand. There are nearly 2 million migrant workers in the country. And uh, I'm not sure whether now the land border has opened, but if it is, then um, yeah, there's a greater chance and opportunity for them to go back to vote in person. I, I would like just just add a little bit because we work a little bit with uh, Cambodian migrant workers in in Thailand, and it sounds like ma many of them. I mean, because in migrant workers in Thailand, they we have a, a mix of register and non-register migrant workers. And of course, for non-register migrant workers, going back to the country and coming back here again is kind of like a, a, a bricks for them to be arrested, and they have to pay a lot of fees to you know <laughs> authorities on the way to be able to come back. Uh, to the country. So many of those who, especially those who not register in Thailand, who may have talked with them, don't want to take s such breaks, so they wouldn't want to go back. It, it's very interesting that uh, the Cambodian government has basically done next to nothing to deal with the issue of absentee voters overseas, uh, in, whether they be in Canada or they be in Europe or the United States or Australia, where have you. There are many Cambodians who are overseas who are still Cambodian citizens and who would like to vote. Uh, but the Cambodian government quite clearly sees these overseas Cambodians as primarily being supporters of the opposition. So there is a political dimension to trying to block uh, people from being able to vote from overseas and forcing people to return back. Uh, I would also note that uh, uh, <clears throat> There has been, you know, there has been efforts by the opposition party, uh, the CNRP and others, to try to reach to migrant workers in Thailand. Uh, this is viewed with uh, uh, hostility by the Thai government and also by the Cambodian government. And in fact, one of the people who was arrested and sent back to Cambodia in November was a person who was a, a migrant worker leader who was not a registered refugee but was a registered migrant worker and he had been active on behalf of the Cambodian National Rescue Party in organizing migrant workers uh, in Thailand to, to exercise their vote. And he was targeted, arrested, and forced back, and he's in pretrial detention somewhere in Cambodia. So quite clearly, there is a political dimension to why the Cambodian government is not facilitating uh, the overseas vote of Cambodians. Just for a, a historic record for your kind information, uh, I was attending a, a meeting in Kuala Lumpur together with Som Rangsi, and then he did organize uh, for himself to meet with the Cambodian workers in Kuala Lumpur. 
But at the same time, there was the high-level ASEAN meeting also in Kuala Lumpur. And Hun Sen, Som Dat Hun Sen knew about Som Ran Si meeting the Cambodian laborers in Kuala Lumpur. So he asked Som Ran Si whether he could join. And the answer was yes. So both Hun Sen and uh, Som Ran Si together did meet, uh, I think, thousands of Cambodian workers in Kuala Lumpur. And I think that's a reflection of the awareness of Som Dat Hun Sen about the very existence of the Cambodian workers in the neighboring ASEAN countries of, of Cambodia and so on. And I do agree with Phil that this is a political tactic. If you have a perception that the foreign work, uh, Cambodian workers outside the country are pro-opposition, then why the hell should I organize, uh, I think, meet uh, what you call elections, things uh, at, the, at the Cambodian embassies and so on. Thank you. Um, yeah, hi, my name is Dan. I work at a local NGO. Um, first of all, thank you to all the panelists um, for your very informative presentations. I want to ask two questions um, piggybacking on the, the prior one about sort of the optics of the, the election. So um, I think there's probably consensus in this room that the, the election is not free and fair, uh, but we've also spoken about co-optation and lack of independence of the media in Cambodia. Um, so I'm wondering if there's any data, either from polling or looking at social media, to suggest that people in Cambodia believe that these are free and fair elections. Um, and then the second sort of related question is, have we seen much of a campaign uh, from the CPP about, uh, in terms of disinformation on social media? Or uh, is that sort of not even worth their time? I mean, yeah, we've got a couple more questions online, but, we'll, but I mean, the optics, um, I would just say that the optics are, I, you know, I mean, it's unclear uh, how the Cambodian people are viewing these elections. I think that um, they've told Anfrel that they want to vote, that they, you know, they want to have democratic elections. Um, but, you know, there's concern. There's always concern related to the issues of violence uh, in the run-up to elections. Uh, there's always concern about intimidation. Uh, you know, local commune chiefs have a great deal of authority and power to basically deny access to services. I mean, you have to go to the commune chief to get many things done, you know, when you're dealing with the government. That's your interface as a villager. And so if you are seen as being pro-Candlelight Party, uh, you will face potential problems from the local CPP commune councillors. And that, that's just the reality. There, it, and how much how much that intimidation is dialed up or dialed down uh, will also depend on how active you are as a, as a, as a person in your community to uh, you know, talk about opposition candidates or to put up a sign or do things that would indicate that you are, in fact, supporting uh, the opposition political party. Okay. Just want to add a little bit. I mean, uh, when you come to disinformation, you question some of these informations. Disinformation in Cambodia meant the disinformation for the government. <laughs> anyway, under the law in Cambodian court, I mean, in every process, you come to disinformation is that disinformation, the government disinformation. So the content has been blocked, taken out, the journalist has been arrested, human rights defenders, those who post things online, political opponents, they are all expressing the information that are disfavor to uh, the government, and uh, that's really an. Uh, I mean, the term disinformation has been really, has already been abused in Cambodian context right now. So, uh, uh, right, I said during the presentations. I mean, uh, without addressing all the gaps and issues in the laws in the justice system, uh, I think it, it, it would be uh, difficult to to uh, to to. to to address the issues and share care. Of course, I mean, now it's difficult and people have to censor themselves. The journalists have to censor themselves. So it's difficult. When, when it comes to statistics, I'm not sure 
if there's a statistic, th I remember there's a statistic of people who expressing the information online and was arrested. There's like almost 100. Last year, 90 something, uh, CCHR was the one who correct this, this number. Uh, I, I can check the exact number and tell you later and probably others want to talk first. Thanks. I think we can move on to other okay, questions. Okay, we've got, I've got two more questions. I'm gonna read them out both and then we can answer them both. Uh, one is from Tim Shaw, uh, who's the director of the National Press Club in Australia in Canberra. So he's viewing us from Canberra. It's quite late there, I guess, right? Um, question, what role should Australia play in furthering democratic principles in Cambodia and in the broader APEC nations? Does the current Australian federal government action or lack thereof in the Solomon Islands diminish the soft power influence of Australia? And then uh, we have another question uh, from Bay Moni, uh, who said, what action of international and regional organizations will be taken against deportation of political prisoners to be executed? So I think that deals with the issue of uh, refugees being sent back to uh, Cambodia. So those are the two questions that we have. Okay, let, let, let me attempt. Uh, I, I think it's about time that uh, the Australian government having, I think, paid a lot of attention to court set up, then to August with the nuclear powered submarine and with uh, voting along the instruction of the United States government on the Ukraine issue that Australia pay attention to the neighbor next door. APHR for the past one year has been in contact with fellow parliamentarians of, uh, of Canberra, of the parliament in Canberra, and so, as well as some of the local politicians in Victoria and, and so on. And we have been asking all our pa Australian parliamentarian friends to raise the issue of Myanmar crisis and Cambodia and so on in the parliament about the human rights situation, and also to, for the MPs to press the federal government to become more proactive, which it, Australia used to be, but lately it has been more or less uh, stepping aside, not active at all on the, either the Cambodian front or on the Myanmar front. So I would like to urge the questioner that please use whatever means you can to press the Australian government to play, to return to Southeast Asia and play a more active role in terms of the pushing for democracy and the human rights promotion and protection uh, and, and so on. Um, on Australia, I would say that unfortunately we have seen continuously that Australia uh, doesn't speak out publicly on human rights, doesn't publicly speak out on democracy. Um, you know, there is, of course, Australia's uh, infamous champagne for dicta with dictators moment uh, when they were basically toasting the Cambodian government uh, with champagne toasts uh, amid the uh, effort to send uh, refugees uh, that Australia was denying entry to back to Cambodia. You know, that um, the refugee swap deal uh, which was uh, outrageous and unacceptable. Um, so, I mean, uh, we would hope that Australia would recognize that they have um, a role to play in, in being more forceful on human rights issues dealing with these aut autocracies like Cambodia, like uh, Myanmar, where we just had the ambassador uh, meeting with uh, Senior General Min Aung Lying, you know, the, the, the bloody handed uh, uh, commander of the military coup. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that you know, we see uh, Australia time and time again failing on basic issues of promoting human rights and democracy. Uh, there's, there's no way around that. Um, with regard to uh, action or lack thereof in the Solomon Islands, I'm not a Pacific Islands expert, uh, but I would say, you know, the soft power influence of Australia is pretty diminished already, uh, regardless of what is happening in the Solomon Islands. Uh, you know. Australia continues to bat well below its weight in terms of what they, what they should be doing. I mean, ask Sean Turnell in Burma, you know, is he ever gonna be, you know, uh, released? You know, you know, we saw a similar case with another Australian 
in Cambodia a couple years ago who spent, you know, better part of 16 months in detention uh, claiming that, you know, for flying a drone over a, uh, an opposition political party rally that somehow he was connected to, uh, you know, a color revolution to overturn the Cambodian government. And the Australian government basically did nothing to help him. So, you know, I'm sorry, I, it, it really is a sore point, but the, the Australian government continues to do less than it should. Uh, a, a bit on the Solomon Island, I, I think, uh, I think uh, the Australian side was being caught, I think, sleeping to allow the Chinese to come to the very underbelly of Austria, Australia through the Solomon Island. And it is a counter move by the Chinese, I think a sort of a revenge for Australia to join the US either under the court or under the August and the overall Indo-Pacific concept of I think containing China. I think that's the reality of things and then Australia have to, to be more alert on the Chinese inroads and so on. The second point is that I could not help in a very negative sense that the Chinese must be paying a hell of a lot to the political leadership of Solomon because they have been doing that all along. You know, in South China Sea, in certain countries, in Southeast Asia mainland, in various countries around the rim of the Indian Ocean. The Chinese have used the, the money to buy leadership all along and I think I would not be surprised for them to have succeeded in, in the Solomon Island. I think they that, did that very successfully with the Cambodian leadership, with the Laotian Communist Party, with the Sri Lankan uh, Rajapaksa. The whole family uh, has been under the payroll of China. But it's up to the people themselves, I think, to stand up to this type of Chinese uh, influence and intervention in the domestic political process and buying of leaders and so on. And that is what we all have to be aware of this, uh, I think, under the table tactic and so on. I could not even help being suspicious of my own government with the three submarine deals with the Chinese and so on, whether uh, money under the table were being paid by some of our military officials and so on. You know, I might be charged with the defamation, most welcome. But I think that type of uh, Chinese behavior, I think it's quite known uh, around the world. Uh, they, they did that in Africa, they did that in Latin America and so on, using the financial power to buy leaderships, to, to win friends and so on. And I think we have to oppose this type of thing. But at the same time, I think the Western side, the United States should not be sleeping over. They must come out. And you cannot keep on sanctioning government for being less democratic and so on. Uh, you can punish certain members of the government for being wayward, but I think uh, Western and the United States government have to keep th on thinking about the, the life of the ordinary people. I think that's where the attention should come in. I did mention this also uh, to, to many embassy here in Bangkok that you cannot only look at the government and political parties. You also have to study who are the democratic forces in each of the ASEAN countries and so on, and try to work with the political movement, with the CSO and so on, in all of this, in order to help build up and strengthen the, I think, democratization institution inside in each of the ASEAN countries and so on. So that's things is not coming. And in spite of the fact that President Biden did organize the democracy summit early of the year and so on, nothing concrete has been forthcoming from the State Department and so on or from the aid agency of how much are they going to work with the, I think, civil societies and uh, communities and so on to strengthen the, I think, the uh, democratic knowledge and the protection of human rights and so on. Otherwise, you can, if you, the, there is no concrete activities by the U.S. together with Japan, South Korea, Australia, and so on in the area, then you get the Chinese inroads through this money politics and the Confucius uh, institution to promote one-party system and authoritarian rule. I think the U.S. administration and I think the Western world and so do know about this, but do not act 
in unison and in a more strengthened manner. Thank you. So I want to add a bit. Uh, first, I, I checked the statistic and uh, Cambodian Center for Human Rights has recorded in 2021 that there were uh, 39 Cambodians who were arrested, jailed, and had arrest warrant issue against them for online, only online, online posts that deemed false to uh, the government. Uh, when it comes to the creations about uh, the refugee, the situation of uh, deportations, uh, just want to share a little bit of a possible good news from Thailand side because most of the many deportations occur in, in Thailand. Uh, the Thai par parliament is now considering the draft uh, law on the prevention and suppression of torture and enforced disappearance. It's already passed uh, the House of Representatives and now it's being considered by the House of the Senate. If it passed, there will be a provisions that will prohibit the deportations of any people who is deemed to be subject to torture, ill treatment, or enforced disappearance in their countries. So if we have this law in the near future, there will be a very important tool uh, for us and for refugees uh, in Thailand, every refugees uh, in Thailand. So I mean, at least under this framework, they'll be protected from uh, being deported. Well, regarding questions about Australia, um, the governments of Germany and Australia, they are the donor um, of this identification of poor household, also known as the ID poor program in Cambodia. Um, unfortunately, in the election uh, context, this is a very centralized uh, program where the local authorities, they are able to identify the poor and vulnerable households who need help, and they will be able to register this household with the uh, authorities. But at the same time, this ID poor program has been used as, as a tool to um, intimidate and also threaten people on the ground, uh, ordinary citizens, to, to not to join any opposition parties or activities. So they say that if you join any opposition, your um, ID poor card will be revoked. So I think donors should be aware of this um, abuse and uh, they should review the implementation mechanism of this program. Let me just say very quickly about the question of the deportations uh, that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, uh, was quite uh, engaged uh, with the um, Thai government when it recognized that uh, people who were uh, recognized refugees were being arrested and sent back. Um, I can't characterize those conversations between UNHCR and the Thai government, but certainly UNHCR stood up for its mandate, which is to protect refugees. Um, and I, I know that a number of senior uh, diplomats in uh, Thailand in various different uh, embassies, which I won't name, uh, were very engaged uh, in dealing with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, with the National Security Council, and others to try to stop uh, these uh, reformal, the deportation of refugees. Uh, and that ultimately there was a case where we had a, <coughs> uh, a Cambodian monk, uh, the Venerable Bobet, who was arrested. Uh, again, we believe on the um, request of the Cambodian side. And they forced him to take off his robes. And uh, this went viral uh, in addition to in addition to the engagement by an officer of the speaker's uh, office in the parliament uh, who was directly engaged. Finally, we were able to turn it around. Uh, there was enough outcry uh, to uh, say that, you know, that Cambodia, uh, Thailand should not go forward with this, sending him back. And he was permitted to go to a third country, in this case, Switzerland, uh, which offered uh, to allow him to go uh, very quickly. And since then, uh, the, the sort of pressure to send people back, uh, send refugees back has diminished. We have had not had new cases uh, of, of that, but it is something that we're constantly monitoring. We're very concerned about because as I mentioned, there are these kind of swap mark deals where uh, the current Thai government is uh, essentially uh, trading favors with autocratic uh, countries uh, in the region uh, to, um, uh, allow them access or to try to send back people who are refugees who have fled from those countries to Thailand. And that is uh, a clear violation of uh, Thailand's um, international human rights obligations. 
is there any other question? Maybe we can take one last question. I've got nothing online, so. Well, if there is no question, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I also would like to thank my colleagues on the panel for joining this press conference. I hope, um, um, well, in the lead up to the election, although like our findings um, say that it's not going to be a free and fair election, but of course we still have hope. And uh, of course we always have hope for democratization in Cambodia and yeah. Um, yeah, once again, the, this is a QR code for to download the NFL's report on our website, so feel free to have a look and also share your comments. Uh, thank you for joining us today, and uh, we have coffee, surf, and some snacks if you have not got it. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.